and we're rolling. Um, and I wanted to continue uh, talking to you folks about ecology. Uh, this is the last week of formal lectures that we're going to have. Uh, after this, um, ah, somebody just uh, wanted to sign on. All right, Chase is here. Good morning. I was just uh, telling everybody that this is the last formal week of lectures. Uh, once this is over, next week uh, will be the final, and the format will be more multiple choice, and it will be you know given on the same day that the final exam would normally have been given if we were still on campus, but I'll give you a 24-hour interval in which you can take it. Uh, so, Yuki, you can get some sleep and take it when it's morning for you, and, you know, Casper, you can, you know, everybody, you can take it whenever you want, except that once you start, you'll have probably about two and a half hours uh, to, to take it, so hopefully you can all make sure that you're comfortable and you have a solid internet connection. Um, and this afternoon, I'll post some practice questions. It will be the same format as before. It will be comprehensive. You know, it'll cover a little bit of everything. Uh, everything from the moment our eyes first met in that classroom uh, to the very end of lecture on Thursday is going to be fair game. I'm going to emphasize what we've covered since the second exam. There will be more questions in depth on ecology than there would be on, let's say, you know, evolution or biodiversity, which we covered at the beginning. Um, so we'll emphasize the later third of the course a bit more than the previous two. Uh, but, you know, it's all connected. It's all, you know, knowledge is all one. Everything joins together. And you're going to need to be able to fit the puzzle pieces together um, if you want to do, uh, to do well on this. So we'll go back to our slides. Da, 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 da. And there we go. Last time we met, we were talking about producers, you know, organisms that create biomass from small molecules. On land, this is mostly plants. In the ocean, it may be seaweeds or single cell protists and bacteria. Uh, they're the base of what we call the trophic pyramid. Uh, they ultimately make biomass, uh, putting together carbon dioxide, water, and some other molecules to make more living stuff, to make all those proteins and nucleic acids and everything else. They get eaten, of course, by consumers, uh, like this panda eating bamboo shoots. And that's the way that biomass and energy both get transferred up the steps of the trophic pyramid. Uh, so the plants get eaten by the bugs, as is happening right now on my lawn, and the bugs get eaten by the little rodents, and the little rodents get eaten by my cats, and so on. Uh, so living matter and, you know, the energy that's stored in it move up these steps of the pyramid. And, of course, it's a pyramid because a lot is lost at every step. But of course, the story doesn't end there because producers and consumers all die. Everything does. And once they're dead, decomposers are what we call the organisms that break them down. Lots of bacteria are decomposers. A great many fungi are. Uh, this is a tree stump that's growing a very common type of fungus called a shelf fungus or a bracket fungus. And incidentally, um, I actually brought a dead log uh, from my yard. And hopefully you can all see this. There's a whitish crust on it. 
Uh, that's actually one type of fungus that's growing on it. And if we come around here, uh, these orange things, that's yet another type of fungus. And this little blob here that looks like jelly is yet another type of fungus. And, oh, over here. And these are more of these bracket fungi or shelf fungi. They look like little shelves growing on the wood. Uh, those are fungi as well. And you're just seeing the fruiting bodies. Uh, but of course, these fungi are growing as this network of filaments. Uh, hopefully, you remember that that's called a mycelium. Um, and of course, if you have fungi growing in your bathroom, you might say, I have mycelium on my ceiling. Uh, right, sorry. Uh, but those filaments are growing through the wood. Uh, the vast majority of the fungus you can't even see because those filaments are penetrating into the wood, cranking out special enzymes and slowly breaking it down. And after about a year or so, uh, the wood's starting to get, you know, really crumbly. I can crumble this bark apart with my bare hands. In another year or so, the wood will be very crumbly. In another couple of years, it may not even exist. What will happen is those fungi, and there's also some bacteria, and there might be animals like termites that help. Ultimately, given enough time, they'll break down that former biomass that used to be a living tree, and they'll convert it back into carbon dioxide, water, and nutrients like nitrogen and things like that. And ultimately, everything is going to get recycled. Uh, all of that wood will end up, the atoms that made it up will go back into feeding a new generation of plants and animals if we just leave them alone for long enough. Everything is ultimately recycled. Every atom in your bodies was once part of a towering tree or a savage predator or something like that. And this has been going on for as long as there has been life on Earth which is that's actually kind of deeply philosophical that all of the atoms that were once in you were part of other living things once. And it seemed deep when I said it. Anyway, it's time to talk about cycles. And the type of cycles that we're going to talk about take place over huge scales. They take place globally. Uh, you can see evidence of them happening all around you. And what you see all around you is all part of cycles that have gone on for as long as there has been life on Earth um, that affect ultimately the entire globe, the biosphere that we're in. So let's go cycling. The first type of cycle is called the hydrologic cycle. Uh, hydro, of course, means it has to do with water. And what ultimately drives the hydrologic cycle is solar energy, energy from the sun. Uh, this, of course, causes water to evaporate. You know, if you've ever seen a puddle drying up, you have seen this. Water is heated by the sun, and the vapor rises into the atmosphere. Ultimately, that vapor forms clouds, and water comes out of the atmosphere in the form of rain. Uh, or sometimes in the form of snow or hail or sleet or what have you. Um, water will fall on the surface of the earth and eventually return to the oceans. Uh, some of it, of course, falls directly back into the oceans uh, or else it will fall on land and ultimately return to the oceans um, in the form of rivers. You know, rainwater will drain into little uh, creeks or brooks, and those will drain into small rivers, and those drain into large rivers, and uh, those ultimately drain into the ocean, of course. Um, what was that country song 20 years ago about two teardrops were floating down the river? And I don't know if you remember that. 
but yeah, that was about the hydrologic cycle, sort of. It can be more complicated than that because some water might drop out of the active cycle. Uh, water that falls as snow in mountainous or Arctic regions may harden into glacial ice uh, and it may stay there for a very long time, many thousands of years. Uh, some water will seep into soil and some of it from there will trickle down possibly quite deep into the rocks underneath and form groundwater, uh, which ultimately returns to the surface in the form of springs or seeps. A seep is like a spring, but instead of water flowing, water just kind of soaks into the soil and you just have a wet spot like a bog or something. Um, Ah, well, I was going to say something intelligent and then completely lost my train of thought. Uh, so water can pass out of the hydrologic cycle for a little while, uh, possibly a very long time, uh, but ultimately it'll come back in. So if you want a picture of the entire hydrologic cycle, uh, there you have one photo showing the whole thing. That's rain over the Pacific Ocean. Hi, cat. What? I'm busy here. Here, come here, stupid cat. Hey, kitty, kitty. Okay, so the sun evaporates water from the ocean. The water vapor rises into the atmosphere. Uh, when it rises, it forms tiny droplets, which form clouds. Uh, when the droplets and the clouds get large enough, they fall down and we have rain and it comes back into the ocean and that's the entire cycle. The carbon cycle, the driving force here is the activity of living things. Photosynthesis is what takes carbon dioxide gas out of the atmosphere. It's actually not the only thing. Uh, the uh, weathering processes of certain rocks can also act to scrub out CO2, carbon dioxide, but the big thing that does it is photosynthesis. Plants and other producers can capture CO2 using some beautiful chemistry that takes place in the chloroplasts. We didn't have time to cover exactly how, but they'll take CO2 out of the atmosphere and convert it into the more complex compounds that we need. Uh, we call this carbon fixation, by the way. We say that plants fix carbon meaning they take it out of the air and convert it into larger um, in molecules that are, that, are, that are necessary for life. So photosynthesis takes CO2 out, and then what puts it in is respiration. Um, when you eat a plant, you break it down, you get energy and biomass from it, and you breathe out carbon dioxide. That's your main waste product that you breathe out, CO2 gas. And, you know, that CO2 and the carbon in your carbon dioxide ultimately came from the food that you ate. And again, the chemistry of how all of this happens is absolutely gorgeous, and we just didn't have time to cover it in detail. But you can think of photosynthesis taking place in chloroplasts and respiration taking place in mitochondria as being kind of mirror images of each other. One of them creates biomass and consumes carbon dioxide. The other breaks down biomass and releases carbon dioxide. So the major driving force of the carbon cycle is living things, photosynthesis and respiration. Now with all of these cycles, you can have extra loops in there. There's no cycle that's just a single one-way loop. Uh, whenever anything burns, that puts carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. Um, when a volcano erupts, that puts carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. CO2 is one of the major volcanic gases. Um, in fact, it can be responsible for, uh, for death. Uh, there have been cases of people that were just smothered to death when a volcano burped out a whole bunch of carbon dioxide. 
some CO2 gets removed by geological processes like weathering of certain minerals. Uh, certain rocks, if they're exposed to the atmosphere, they will very, very slowly chemically change and crumble. And that process can consume CO2. So there's always lots of little side loops, but the big one is driven by photosynthesis and respiration. Since we're talking about CO2, let's talk a little bit about this whole global climate change that people are freaking out about for various reasons, or they used to when they weren't freaking out about the goddamn coronavirus. The basics of it works like this. Um, when the sun shines on the earth, most of the sun's energy passes right through the atmosphere. Uh, the evidence for this is the fact that you can see. Uh, if the atmosphere blocked solar energy or absorbed solar energy, it would be completely dark at the surface. Uh, but the fact that you're seeing, you know, anything shows that most of the light that the sun gives off makes it through the atmosphere and reaches the surface of the earth. I mean, I can see it now looking at the sun shining on well, what I'm looking at from here is my driveway. You, know, you can see that by seeing the sun on the vegetation behind me. So most of the energy that comes from the sun reaches the Earth's surface. An exception that you might have heard of is that a layer of the Earth's atmosphere called the stratosphere, which is 12 to 19 miles above the surface, uh, sorry for those who work in metric, uh, that is click, 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 what? That's about 19 kilometers um, up to, nineteen and 19, I'm gonna call it about um, something like 19 to 30 kilometers above the surface. Um, is the lower part of a layer of the Earth's atmosphere called the stratosphere. That layer happens to be rich in a form of oxygen called ozone. Uh, ozone is actually toxic if it's down at the surface. If you've ever been around very powerful electrical equipment, uh, that can strong electrical discharges can actually generate ozone. And if you've ever noticed kind of a metallic, like a metal smell, kind of sharp, and I'm not quite sure how to describe it, but a sharp smell around high voltage electrical transformers or something like that. If you've ever smelled that, you've smelled ozone. And at the Earth's surface, it's considered a pollutant. It's actually bad for your nose and your lungs if you breathe it. Up in the lower stratosphere, the ozone absorbs 97% of the sun's medium frequency ultraviolet light. Uh, since ultraviolet light damages DNA, uh, this is why people are concerned about the ozone layer. If that goes away, we have a lot more damaging light, a lot more damaging UV reaching the surface of the earth and you know everybody gets skin cancer then. Anyway, as solar energy hits the solid earth and the water, these get hot. Now, when I was a little kid, we used to go to a swimming pool. And to get there, I had to walk, we had to walk across a, um, a parking lot, uh, which of course was black on a hot day. And my mother would always tell me to put my sandals on, but I was so eager, I would sometimes forget. And then, of course, I would, you know, burn my feet uh, running across that, you know, black asphalt parking lot on a very hot day. And I'm sure some of you have similar childhood memories. Uh, that's evidence that as solar energy, you know, light and infrared radiation and ultraviolet radiation, as those contact the solid earth and the water, those heat up, right? As those heat up, they start giving off energy as well. Uh, they don't just give off heat energy that you can feel, 
but they start giving off energy in the form of infrared radiation, uh, which you can't see with your eyes, but if you've ever used a thermal camera or something like that, or a uh, night vision uh, scope, uh, those instruments do detect the kind of energy that warm things are constantly giving off. Uh, they're giving off energy in a form called infrared. And the atmosphere does efficiently absorb that. So it's not direct sunlight that makes air hot. It's sunlight falling on the earth and then being re-radiated, being re-emitted from the warm earth and the warm oceans in the form of infrared radiation that the atmosphere does soak up. That's what makes the atmosphere warm. And there are some gases in the atmosphere that are very good at that, at absorbing heat from, absorbing energy from the warm earth. Water vapor does it, carbon dioxide gas does it, and methane, a carbon with four hydrogens stuck on it, otherwise known as natural gas. Those happen to be very good at absorbing the energy that the earth gives off and they tend to make the entire atmosphere warmer. Looks a little bit like this. You have energy that's constantly passing through the atmosphere and falling on the Earth. As the Earth warms up, the Earth gives off infrared, and that infrared energy is absorbed by carbon dioxide gas, represented by these molecules that look like uh, kind of a blue Mickey Mouse face, and then when they heat up, they give off energy and send it back to the Earth and keep it in the atmosphere. So those gases act kind of like a blanket, right? What keeps you warm under a blanket is not that the blanket itself is warm, unless it's an electric blanket, but the blanket traps your body's heat, keeps it from you know, radiating out into nowhere, and keeps it close to you. It traps your own natural heat and keeps it close. Uh, the same thing is true for fur. Uh, the fur of an animal keeps that animal's body heat and keeps it from radiating out into you know, the great beyond. It keeps that heat close to the animal. The atmosphere does the same thing. It acts like a blanket that traps the Earth's heat and keeps it close to the surface. So what warms the Earth is not just the sun, it's this process of what we call re-radiation from the atmosphere, reflecting almost heat from the Earth and reflecting it back onto the Earth. And as I mentioned, carbon dioxide gas is very good at absorbing this energy from the warm Earth and re-radiating it back to the Earth this is not quite accurately named, but this is what people mean when they talk about the greenhouse effect. Uh, actual greenhouses don't quite work this way, uh, but we're kind of stuck with it. Uh, and this is why carbon dioxide um, and methane are known as greenhouse gases. They're just very good at trapping this uh, infrared energy and reflecting it back onto the Earth's surface and keeping the Earth warm. For the record, the basics of how this all works was worked out in 1896 by a Swedish guy named Svante Arrhenius. Um, he's sometimes called the father of physical chemistry. Uh, he's the guy who developed the concept of activation energy, which you learned about when we talked about enzymes. And you know, um, our president got some votes when he claimed that this whole global warming thing was a Chinese conspiracy to destroy U.S. industry. Uh, maybe you know people who believe that. But the basic physics of how all of this works have been understood for over 120 years. Uh, this is not something that just got cooked up recently to destroy American industry. We've known how well this works for, you know, quite some time. And if it, I mean, it, I guess it could be a Swedish conspiracy, but, you know, at least the Chinese aren't at fault for this one. 
for the record, you also need greenhouse gases in the atmosphere because if you didn't have them, the earth wouldn't retain any heat. You know, the earth would be like you trying to keep warm in a cold room with no blanket and the surface of the earth would completely freeze over and we'd end up with, you know, I think something like, uh, like 90 degrees below Fahrenheit, which I can't be bothered to do in my head to convert to Celsius, but it's extremely cold. Uh, maybe something like 60 below Fahrenheit, uh, Celsius. Um, there was actually a time about 600 million years ago when we think the earth did lose most of its greenhouse gases and there were glaciers all the way to the equator back then, a time called snowball earth. I've actually explored some of the evidence for this in Australia and also in the Western United States. You can find glacial rock deposits on land that used to be close to the equator, uh, dating from this time. So you need some degree of greenhouse effect in order for the earth to be livable. If it didn't have the greenhouse effect going, if we had no greenhouse gases, the earth would look like the ice planet Hoth from Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back. Hopefully you've all seen that. But in 1958, this guy, a guy named Charles David Keeling, uh, set up a base on the largest island in the state of Hawaii. Uh, that island is also called the island of Hawaii, but most people just call it the Big Island. And there's a pair of volcanoes on the Big Island, uh, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa worth a visit, you could actually drive up to the top of both of them. Uh, Mauna Kea has a big observatory on top. Uh, they're tall enough to get some snow, so it is possible to go skiing in Hawaii in the morning and then go down and surf in the afternoon, if that's your idea of a good time. Uh, do it if you get the chance. Anyway, he set up a base on Mauna Loa in 1958 and he started measuring the concentration of carbon dioxide gas. The reason being is that it's high up on a mountain. It is not downwind from any major pollution source and the atmosphere should be pretty well mixed by global weather. So if you want a place to sample, to estimate uh, what's going on in the entire atmosphere, uh, or at least in the entire Northern hemisphere, that's a pretty good spot. Uh, he also did some observations at other parts of the world as well. Uh, but the Mount Aloha station has been maintained ever since 1958. What he found looks like this. In um, spring and summer, the great forest of the Northern Hemisphere, the forests that cover well, that used to cover much of the United States, that still cover most of Northern Canada and Northern Europe and Siberia, that great taiga forest that goes on and on from like Norway all the way across to Alaska, those forests begin to grow. And by about the time you're in May, they're growing, they're adding new wood, and all of those trees, all of those billions of trees are putting out billions and billions of new leaves. To do that, they're having to do photosynthesis. And the collective activity of those countless billions of trees all doing photosynthesis in the spring is enough that it measurably sucks down the global concentration of carbon dioxide. So that peak right there that's in May, that's the point when those trees start really kicking into gear and doing that photosynthesizing. And of course, doing it, you know, 18, 20, 24 hours a day because the days are so long. And there's enough of them that you can measure how much they pull carbon dioxide gas down. So by the time you get to September, October, uh, all those trees have sucked down a huge amount of carbon dioxide, taken it out of the atmosphere. However, 
once you get to September and October, uh, the light, um, there's less light, of course. The days start getting shorter in September. Uh, the temperature gets much colder. Uh, growth stops. Uh, leaves fall for many species. Um, others, of course, you know, evergreens, they don't, but uh, deciduous trees all lose their leaves. And all of those dead leaves and dead wood and all of those consumers that might be eating leaves uh, returns most of that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. So over the course of a year, you go from a rising global level of CO2 down to a, a falling level of CO2 when all of those plants start photosynthesizing like crazy, and then the levels rise again when photosynthesis stops. So you're looking at the signature of the carbon cycle on a truly global level. This is your cue if you want to, to say, ooh, wow. I'm always kind of astonished by it myself. However, up there in the upper left, you see that seasonal cycle. But on top of that seasonal cycle, there's a longer term rise going on in carbon dioxide concentrations. At 1958, uh, globally, we were at, I think, about 310 um, parts per million. Um, that's a lot less than parts per hundred, which is percent. This is parts per million. It's not much, but we were at 310 parts per million in 1958. Uh, we're currently up to about 410, and the rise has been pretty darn steady. There's been a few little times when the curve didn't grow quite as fast, but it's been rising very steadily over the past um, 50, I guess we're up to 60... Uh, can't do math this morning without coffee, 62 years. And what that tends to do is raise average global temperatures because the more CO2 is in the atmosphere, the better that atmosphere traps heat, the thicker that blanket becomes. This isn't news, by the way. In 1965, uh, well, Keeling, the guy who worked all this out, actually noticed as far back as 1958 that this could, if this trend continued, it would lead to, you know, climate change. The president, President Lyndon Johnson, first heard word of it from the Presidential Scientific Advisory Board in 1965. Uh, so we've known about this for a very long time. Um, up until very recently, nobody has really had the political will to do anything about it. Um, what we should do about it is, of course, still hotly debated politically, but the science is not some new thing that, you know, somebody cooked up because they're wanting to destroy American jobs and hate the petroleum industry and all of that. This is shit we've known about for a long time. Why is it happening is, okay, things live, and then they die, and then they rot, but some living things don't rot because they get buried. And then they might form fossils, of course. Uh, we talked about fossils. There have been times when there's been so much life on certain parts of the earth that when it's died, it's been buried and it's built up and formed very thick deposits. Um, and these deposits, after being compressed, become coal, oil, and natural gas. All of those used to be living things. I don't know if you can still do this, but there were actually great big swamps with huge trees and very lush and thick vegetation in western Arkansas approximately 300 million years ago, maybe a bit more, maybe three, yeah, about 300, close enough. And if you know the right place in Western Arkansas, for those of you from Arkansas, this is around towns like Coal Hill and Scranton, 
and Clarksville, that area, uh, if you look in rocks in the right spot, you could actually find fossil plants uh, dating from this time period. But many of those plants, as they lived in the swamp, they lived, they died, they got buried over millions of years, they built up and they turned into coal. Arkansas used to have uh, pretty big coal beds, although they have almost all been mined out completely and filled in. Uh, there's very little coal industry in Arkansas, but back in 1890, it was quite large. Uh, the same is true for coal deposits in, um, well, where do we have them here? Kentucky and Pennsylvania and coal deposits in what parts of Germany have lots of it and so on. There's coal in a lot of places. Um, much the same is true, by the way, for petroleum. Uh, crude oil. All of those used to be alive. And so these were part of, you know, these dead plants and animals were part of the carbon cycle 300 million years ago, but they've been locked out of the carbon cycle because they were buried and stashed under the surface of the earth uh, for many, many millions of years. So that CO2 that was taken out of the carbon cycle, when we burn them, when we dig up coal or pump oil and we burn them, we're taking that very old carbon and putting it back into circulation. We're putting it back into the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. As I've said, you need a little bit of greenhouse effect uh, because if you didn't have it, the earth surface would get all the way down to the surface of the moon. Okay, that's 153 Celsius, below zero Celsius. That's even colder than I thought it was going to be. Now, if you think about it, the moon is roughly the same distance from the sun as the earth. The moon's not getting more solar energy, but without an atmosphere, the moon can't trap the solar energy that it has. So the surface of the moon gets bitterly cold. And now I'm remembering when I was an undergraduate, there was a bar we used to go to that everybody referred to as the moon because it had no atmosphere, you see. Right. And then I came here and there are no bars. Anyway, we've started to notice this rise in global temperature. And this is starting to have noticeable effects on human life. Weather patterns are starting to shift. Um, there's been debate about this, but it's looking like the frequency and intensity of certain storms may be increasing. We may be in for more and or bigger tornadoes and hurricanes simply because there's more energy in the atmosphere and that energy has to do things. We're starting to see melting of the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica that has the potential to raise sea levels and mess with ocean circulation patterns in various weird ways. And I don't have time to cover all of this. We've got more cycles to cover too. But it's starting to worry not just the long-haired, freaky, dirt hippies and the druggies in Christiana and, you know, all of that. It's starting to worry, you know, people like the U.S. Navy, which is not known as a bastion of tree-hugging hippie liberalism, partly because of rising sea levels and partly because of a different problem, subsiding land. In the next four years, Norfolk, Virginia is forecast to see a sea level increase of five feet. Now, this bothers the military because the largest naval base in the world is at Norfolk, Virginia. That's where we park um, most of our aircraft carriers, for example, uh, they're parked at Norfolk. Norfolk is already pretty darn low. Five feet might not seem a lot, but that's enough to cause flooding. Even if it doesn't rise that much, you know, the higher the sea level is, the more intense the floods are going to be you know, when you have a storm that pushes water onto land. Uh, they've already noticed that in the past 50 years, the uh, frequency of surface flooding has been getting higher in cities all over the east coast of the United States. 
uh, shoot, when the tide comes in in Miami these days, you get seawater coming up through the sewage systems and out onto the street. And in October 2014, the Pentagon declared that climate change poses risks to U.S. national security. And the Pentagon, say what you will about it, is not noted for, you know, screaming fake news or, you know, the Pentagon's business is not to generate fake news. The Pentagon's business is not to go out and hug trees. If the Pentagon's worried, it's probably something we should be taking seriously. Okay, right. Uh, brief pause. Questions, anybody? Comments? Rotten fruit. Okay, I'm hearing dead silence, so I assume you're all just completely stunned. Let's look at the other cycles. There's four that I want you to know. They're not the only four, but the four that I want you to know include the hydrologic cycle, the carbon cycle, and then the nitrogen cycle. And the major driving force here are twofold. One is lightning. There's lots of nitrogen gas in the atmosphere. In fact, most of the atmosphere is nitrogen gas, 78%. The problem is that most organisms can't use it. Uh, simple nitrogen gas is just two atoms of nitrogen stuck to each other, uh, written N2, and most organisms have no way of using that. You can't extract nitrogen from the air you breathe. Most living things can't. The things that do take nitrogen out of the air and put it into circulation in the biosphere are lightning. Uh, big, you know, electrical sparks in the sky can actually convert nitrogen into a form that plants can absorb. You know, there's a reason why the Vikings worshipped Thor not only as a war god, but a fertility god as well. Uh, lightning makes the earth fertile. The other thing that does it is uh, certain bacteria have the ability to take nitrogen in the atmosphere and convert it into usable compounds. And we call that nitrogen fixation. We talked about carbon fixation where you're taking carbon dioxide gas and converting it into a form that can pass through um, the food chain. Nitrogen fixing is the same. You're taking nitrogen gas and turning it into a form that living things can use. And then the nitrogen gets taken up by plants. The plants get eaten by animals, you know, da, 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 da. Ultimately, a group of decomposing bacteria called denitrifying bacteria break down the nitrogen compounds and re-release nitrogen gas back into the atmosphere and we complete that cycle. So the driving forces here are lightning plus bacteria driving the nitrogen cycle. Uh, brief moment, admit. Good morning, Glenn. Okay, check in the chat to see if anyone has anything to say. Uh, good morning, Glenn Norris, good to see you. Um, I'll go right back to the slides. We've been talking about how substances go through cycles in uh, the, natural, uh, the natural world. And we covered the water cycle and the carbon cycle. We're talking now about the nitrogen cycle, uh, which is driven by lightning and certain bacteria called nitrogen fixing bacteria taking nitrogen gas out of the atmosphere and turning it into a form that organisms can use. You might remember that you need this because, you know, think back to proteins being made of amino acids. Well, they stick together because of those amino, uh, those peptide bonds between an amino group and a carboxyl group. Go back and look this up if you don't remember. Uh, that amino group contains an atom of nitrogen. You've got to have nitrogen to have amino acids, and you can't have proteins without amino acids. And DNA bases, 
also contain nitrogen. All that adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil um, contain nitrogen in addition to carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, right? You can't make DNA if you don't have a source of nitrogen. And here's an example you might be familiar with, um, especially if um, you, like Alexandria, are stuck in West Memphis right now. You probably have lots of soybeans pretty close. Most members of a plant family that we call the legumes, uh, this is the family that include beans and peas, uh, soybeans, as well as, you know, red beans and black beans and all of that. Uh, alfalfa and clover, uh, some flowers that you might know, like wisteria is in here, uh, even some trees you might have heard of, like mesquite trees. These are all in a big family of flowering plants uh, that we call legumes. And most leg legumes make these lumps on their roots called nodules. Uh, you can see them in these picture, these little round things that are clumped together on a plant root. And those nodules are packed full of nitrogen-fixing bacteria. This is another great example of symbiosis. Uh, the bacteria get some food and shelter from the plant, and in exchange, if you will, in this mutualistic symbiosis, they take nitrogen out of the air and the soil, and convert it into a form that the plant can absorb and they nourish the host plant and ultimately some of that nitrogen is made available to other plants and animals as well. Um, I know people that will grow clover for a year and then plow it under and that actually makes the soil more fertile because there's more nitrogen present because clover is a legume. Uh, my wife reminds me that she did that in our garden this year. We have a lot of clover in our garden uh, that I really need to hoe up, but uh, it will make our soil much more fertile. Mm -hmm. Thank you, love. Right. Anyway, um, so that nitrogen is ultimately made available to other plants it'll, and ultimately to animals. If bugs eat the clover, they'll get nitrogen from it, and then birds will get nitrogen from the bugs, and so it goes. Little note, most of the nitrogen fertilizer that is actually used in agriculture, most of the stuff that you could buy down at the agricultural co-op in 50-pound bags, is actually made from atmospheric nitrogen plus a hydrogen source like natural gas by an industrial process called the Habel-Bosch process. It was invented by, by the way, by a German chemist named Fritz Haber, who was very interested in nitrogen chemistry. And he used his Habel-Bosch process both to make fertilizer and you can also use it to make high explosives. In fact, sometimes they're the same thing. If you remember or hear, heard about uh, the bombing of Oklahoma City in 1995, uh, the terrorists that did that uh, blew up um, much of a US government building using a van that was packed full of ammonium nitrate fertilizer uh, together with some diesel fuel and a detonator. Uh, fertilizer and explosives both use nitrogen chemistry, and Fritz Haber didn't really care. Uh, so his invention has made possible both great increases in the food supply and also terrible destruction. You know, Haber was kind of an uncomfortable character because he didn't really bother about the uses to which his chemistry was being put. You know, it was all just fun. Last one, the phosphorus cycle, much slower. Phosphorus, you need phosphorus, if you might remember DNA, the sides of that double helix twisted ladder are made of sugar and phosphate groups, right? Every nucleotide has a phosphate. The same is true for ATP. You need phosphate there, 
You need phosphate, you need it in your teeth. Uh, phosphorus is very important for life. It's one of, you know, chinops, if you remember that, uh, those top six chemical elements that life needs and is built of. And the main driving force of the phosphorus cycle is the erosion of rocks. Some rocks are rich in it. When rocks erode, that phosphorus is released. It ultimately gets taken up by plants and the plants get eaten by animals and so on. Ultimately, that phosphorus moves to the oceans in runoff. Uh, when plants die, when animals poop, when animals die, phosphorus ultimately washes out into streams and rivers and ultimately to the ocean. And it may stay there for many millions of years in sediments in the ocean, the mud and the silt and all of that that builds up on the bottom. And then very slow processes of mountain building uh, that can take this mud on the bottom of the ocean and ultimately, you know, turn it into rock making up part of a mountain. Ultimately, that returns phosphorus to the cycle. So this one is driven by very slow erosion and formation of rocks, and it runs at a much slower rate than, let's say, the hydrologic cycle does. So that one's driven by geology. Most of the phosphorus that you need for agriculture is mined from areas that are rich in phosphate rock. Uh, the country of Morocco, for example, happens to be rich in phosphate rock deposits. And you can take this rock, grind it, add it to soils. Unfortunately, if like you needed more shit to worry about, world supplies of phosphates are projected to start dropping in the next 30 years. Uh, we don't have an infinite amount of phosphate-rich rock uh, that we can use as fertilizer. So don't worry about that right now because we got the coronavirus going on, but put that on your calendar to worry about in the next 30 years. Last little thing. In industrial agriculture, nitrogen and phosphorus aren't usually cycled. Um, if you're a corn farmer in Iowa, where this picture was taken, uh, for you know, Yuki and Casper, Iowa is probably even less familiar than Arkansas. It's a state north of here that grows an ungodly amount of corn. Like, unbelievable amounts of corn. I've got family up there. The place is just loaded with corn. Farmers every year buy fertilizer, they spread it on their fields. Some of that fertilizer, of course, gets taken up by the plants and goes into, you know, helping the corn grow. And then some of that, of course, gets taken up by people that eat the corn or cows that eat the corn because most of that corn is actually used to feed cattle. And then some of that nitrogen gets taken up by people that eat the cows that eat the corn, and et cetera, et cetera. But there's always lots of fertilizer that the plants can't use, uh, that they don't have time to use, that they don't soak up, uh, that's extra that they don't need. And whatever the plants don't use washes out of the soil. You can see there's water draining out of the soil into a little drainage ditch right there. And in season, that water would contain lots of that excess nitrogen and phosphorus. And it runs into drainage ditches, which drain into ultimately into rivers and lakes. And here's what happens when that happens. Whenever you have a body of water that gets a big input of nutrients, like lots of fertilizer, lots of nitrogen and phosphorus, the bacteria and the algae go crazy. They start growing like you wouldn't believe. They've got plenty of water, they've got plenty of carbon. Now there's loads of nitrogen and phosphorus coming in and the algae and the bacteria bloom. The whole water turns green. The problem is that algae and bacteria, like all things, die. Uh, 
And as they die, they rot. And the process of rotting or decay is a process that consumes oxygen. Uh, those decomposer bacteria that are breaking down dead algae and all of that, they need oxygen and they use it up. And the end result is that while you've got loads of algae growing up on the surface, the water below the surface becomes depleted in oxygen. That decay process sucks it up and it becomes so depleted that nothing can live in it. And we call that process eutrophication. And that's a view of a pond that is very highly eutrophied. Lots and lots of algae up on the surface. I would bet money there's no fish worth talking about um, underneath that surface because there's not much oxygen in that pond. This is a satellite picture. You're looking at Lake Erie. Uh, that big dark thing uh, kind of in the middle is Lake Erie. On the south side of it, you have the state of Ohio and Michigan. Uh, you have Michigan to the left of it on the east side. Uh, to the north of it, that's actually part of Canada right there. Uh, Detroit is visible and south of that you have uh, Windsor, Ontario. And if you look at the lower left part of that uh, picture, uh, you can see there's green swirly stuff in the lake water. And that is eutrophication taking place in the Great Lakes. Uh, some of that caused by sewage running off uh, from the cities. And some of it caused by big blooms of algae, uh, well, caused by runoff from agriculture because there are lots of farms in, uh, you know, that are close to rivers that drain into Lake Erie and the other Great Lakes. So that's a bloom of eutrophication at the south end of Lake Erie. Um, I can't point it out to you, but one of those kind of gray spots on the south side of the lake is actually the city of Toledo, Ohio. And in August 2014, Eutrophication in the lake got so bad that the city had to shut off its water supply. The reason is grow, um, one of the side effects is they can actually produce toxins. And the drinking water of Toledo comes from Lake Erie, and the water supply was building up so many toxins from the algae that it was becoming dangerous to drink. Uh, so 400,000 people temporarily had to go without tap water. That's the kind of problems that eutrophication can cause. You know, problems big enough that you can see them from space. And down where I come from in South Louisiana, you could actually see my house on that uh, satellite uh, picture. Um... You know, creeks run into little rivers, and little rivers run into big rivers, and everything drains into the Mississippi River. Uh, Two-thirds of the United States, uh, water will ultimately drain into the Mississippi River and then out into the Gulf of Mexico. That red zone that you see, this is done in so-called false color, uh, but that's areas of algae growth. Uh, caused by nutrient-rich water draining into the Mississippi River and into some rivers that branch from the Mississippi that you can't see clearly, uh, like the Atchafalaya River, close to where I grew up. That's creating a huge zone of eutrophication in the Gulf of Mexico. And to some extent, this is natural because the Mississippi has always received water from two-thirds of the United States, and it's always put nutrients into the Gulf of Mexico, but agricultural runoff is making the, uh, is making the process greater, and there's a zone of the Gulf of Mexico where the bottom water doesn't have any oxygen in it. It's called the dead zone, and it's so low in oxygen that animals can't live there. Most can't, anyway. <laughs> 
And there's worries that it's threatening commercial fisheries uh, because the Gulf of Mexico is home to something like a third of the United States seafood industry. Uh, we get lots of oysters, uh, lots of fish, uh, crabs from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there's lots of recreational fishing. Uh, my dad goes down there and fishes an awful lot when he gets the chance. Uh, but there's also commercial fishing as well. And there is concern that the dead zone could grow large enough to be a threat to that. Um, you know, seafood is kind of a big deal if you live in South Louisiana. Last thing I'll talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, I've just carried out nutrient cycling by swallowing a bug. You hear a lot about organic gardening and organic farming and organic produce. Now, as to whether organic food is truly better for you, many would argue that it's been kind of overhyped. But the original point of organic farming is to make use of natural cycling as much as possible. You know, if you're a typical corn farmer in Iowa, you buy fertilizer, you spread it on your fields, a lot of it washes off your fields down the river and ultimately into the ocean. Um, it's essentially a one-way trip. Nitrogen goes from fields to rivers to the sea and it doesn't really come back. On the other hand, if you build a compost bin uh, like that and you take your grass clippings and the weeds from your garden and your food waste and you let them rot and you put them back into your garden, you're keeping the nutrients cycling through the local ecosystem. You're basically making use of natural cycling. And that means you don't have to add nearly as much fertilizer. Uh, you can take not just, not so much nitrogen, but phosphorus and other nutrients that plants need, and you can keep them in place. Now, if you think about it, nobody ever had to go fertilize a forest, right? I mean, you know, you don't have to go around and spread fertilizer to keep your trees growing, uh, simply because in a forest, what happens? Well, plants, you know, make plant growth and then animals eat it and then animals poop and animals die and decomposers make the poop and the dead animals rot and decomposers make the dead plants rot and ultimately they return all of those nutrients back into the local ecosystem and you don't, you know, there's no need for much in the way of input. And the idea of organic farming is to make your farm or your garden do exactly the same thing. Instead of a one-way trip, you're taking, you know, that one-way trip and you're bending it into a cycle that can, uh, that can go on in your backyard. In fact, it's going on in my backyard right now. Uh, we've got a compost heap and we're using it to fertilize our garden. That's the real point of organic farming, is you're taking these nutrient cycles that we've talked about and using them for your own benefit on your own farm or in your own garden, and you don't have to buy as many things to input into your farm, your garden, whatever it might be. And again, that mimics what you see in nature. There's some dead leaves in a forest. They'll rot they'll get broken down by, there's animals that will eat dead leaves, earthworms and roly polies and certain insects and things like that. Fungi break them down, bacteria break them down. All of those atoms that they used to be made of go back into the soil and ultimately can get reused by a new generation of trees. I'll spare you singing It's the Circle of Life from The Lion King, but that's kind of what I feel like singing right now. And that would be that. Uh, let's see, do I have any, there we are. Uh, do I have any questions? Have I made this all as clear as a transparent glass filled with the light of mental illumination? <laughs> 
Any questions I can take before I stop recording? All right, if you don't feel like talking, you can use the chat. All right, I will assume that I have just dazzled you with my utter brilliance. So I'm gonna stop recording now and we're done.